So with that, we'll let you start your report. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the school board, um, we appreciate the uh, thematic lightning as, uh, lighting as we highlighted our school board. So we'll, that was another uh, treat for you all. Uh, we'll begin with our, uh, our superintendent's report. And um, as always, I like to talk about uh, the work that we do and, and how we uh, go about this in a systematic way. Uh, since uh, July, I have been uh, sharing how we should operate as a system, uh, meaning uh, while we may have different groups, different ideas, we already come together as a whole and operate in unison, asking three critical questions. Why are we here? How are we gonna do this work? What are the outcomes? And what is the, the community, say our parents, our students, our stakeholders, do they give us the feedback that aligns to uh, this vision? Our vision that uh, I will continue with and so uh, fortunate that uh, this board saw fit me to become the permanent superintendent is to lead in the direction in which our community of teachers and staff uh, gave for us and that was to love and grow our students. And our how, we're answering that question through the mission that we established. And as we uh, move through this work, we realize that uh, accomplishing this mission is uh, faced with ever-growing challenges. Uh, one of those we see is working during COVID. Uh, one of my favorite episodes of I Love Lucy is the episode where they're wrapping chocolates. And as the conveyor belt speed up, we saw increased stress, increased errors, the workload increase, and uh, as a continuation, it would be lowering of the attendance rate. Uh, this is a dramatization, but our teachers, our staff, uh, they're going through the same thing. I know you and your workplaces are seeing this as well. And uh, we, uh, in order to be able to meet this mission, uh, have to recognize that education is changed and that we must adapt and we must change our workflows uh, so that we can reduce the stress, reduce the errors, make manageable workloads to uh, not only attract uh, great people to our work, but to retain them. Uh, we saw that even recently with our, our COVID uh, numbers. Uh, I wanna ask uh, Director Van Holden to come forward uh, to uh, share with us what we're seeing uh, regionally in terms of uh, our, this Omicron variant and its impact in our community. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Yes, what we've seen uh, in the last few weeks with the Omicron variant uh, across Lexington and Richland counties is a tremendous increase in the two-week incidence rate. Uh, the graph in front of you uh, tracks that two-week incidence rate, which has been a metric that we've been monitoring all year because it influences the county risk level. Uh, the county risk level is one of the key things that we use to determine the mitigation levels that we have in the district. So with this statistic, it, it's basically an indicator of the um, uh, incidents uh, per uh, segment of the community that we um, keep tracking. And what we've seen is the numbers uh, have skyrocketed uh, since the end of December. Uh, you can see that we were uh, where our peak was in September, or so, since the end of December, I should say. You can see where we were in September uh, when we had our previous high uh, on the two-week incidence rate in Lexington and Richland counties. And we had a steady decline uh, through November where the level dipped down uh, below about 201, which dropped us. That's when we were in the period where we were having uh, green and yellow mitigation levels. Uh, we kind of hovered steadily around uh, the just below uh, 201 there. Uh, and what we've seen is uh, the, the decline flattened off and then uh, increased dramatically uh, with Omicron. And that has presented uh, several challenges here in the operations of the school district. Uh, you can see the students uh, who have been impacted uh, by COVID over the last few weeks since our return to school and the staff uh, trends mirror that as well. What we've seen in terms of uh, students is that our seven uh, highest or our nine highest days of positive uh, numbers of positive students that have been uh, turned into us that have been documented, those have all been in January. 
for our number of students who have been impacted, the seven highest days of this school year have all been in January. So again, we have a high number of positives that are being reported on a daily basis with students, as well as a high number of, um, of total impacted students. What you can also see with this, uh, with this specific uh, variant of COVID is the um, increased number in the purple and the blue sections of that chart, which are the positive students, as well as the isolated students. With staff, we've seen a very similar trend. Uh, the top 10 days for the number of new positives reported among staff have all been in January. The top 10 days of staff who have been impacted have all been in January as well. Uh, with that, we saw a peak of 196 staff who were impacted uh, on January 13th, which is of course, um, the day before uh, we uh, went to uh, red risk level across the district. So that's uh, the information on COVID. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Ross for any questions. And as we uh, see here, this uh, dip, and Director Holden, you would agree with me that does it, that represents days we weren't collecting uh, due to school closures, not necessarily what's represented in the schools, correct? So on days we're not doing in-person instruction, uh, we actually delay the reporting because we're not sure that we'll have accurate results on those days uh, due to a variety of factors, especially with positive. So we typically collect that positive information while the students are out and staff are out. We then report it on the day they return. Uh, what we typically see though, is in that absence, uh, the, the quarantine numbers come down significantly. So if you look at that gray section of that chart, the quarantine has dropped dramatically because you then have students who are returning back from a quarantine but we do uh, typically uh, see an increase on those, uh, the positive numbers on the days that we return, uh, but then it, it kind of, those students then move to the isolated section. Um, so typically what's happening there is when we have those uh, closures, uh, whether it's the, um, the one we had on January 14th, or uh, we don't have the final numbers from today yet, but obviously we had the inclement weather day on, on, uh, on Friday. Uh, we may see a, a decline there because the students who are in that gray section, the staff who are in that gray section who are quarantined may be returning. Uh, what we don't know, of course, we can't predict the future. Uh, we don't know is how many positives we'll have uh, this week and then how that will impact the number of quarantined students. Of course, we have the changing guidelines as well. So, does that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. Any questions for Director Holden? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, what he alludes to is also uh, having an impact on our attendance as a, as a faculty. Uh, I brought to you back in October uh, our, our weekly absences data, and so you can see since the beginning of the year, uh, the August 23rd through 27th date, um, the weekly averages, and, and that was a, a good week of 465 uh, absences in that week. Um, the week in which we had to move to virtual, um, you saw the peak of uh, 1,131 absences uh, in that week. Uh, it reflects the same graph that Director Holden just took us through. Uh, we have a commitment, uh, not only legally, but to provide a safe in-person learning environment for our students. And our goal is to, is to be in-person this, in this week of January 10th through the 14th is the only date on our record where the number of uh, unfilled uh, uh, actually exceeded our field. And so in October, the week of October 22nd, which we actually reported at the board meeting on October 25th, you can see our weekly average was 607 requests, 220 unfilled, we're filling 388. Uh, a week. Uh, that rose uh, the week of January 14th to 672 requests. Uh, we were feeling more, but we still weren't able, it's like that conveyor belt with the chocolates, we weren't able to uh, actually meet uh, the number of field. Just to give perspective, in the height of Delta, we had 56 or 57, if you're going to round it off, unfilled classes a day. Uh, January the uh, 14th, uh, January, the, the week of January 14th, that height, we had 117 unfilled classes. Everybody pitched in, and I want to thank the administration, the chief, we sent the district office uh, people to cover class. Uh, uh, a lot of us covered classes to try to keep open. Um, 
I put out a uh, urgent message uh, asking for subs. Uh, I want to apologize for any confusion to make it think that you could sign up Wednesday night and actually sub Thursday. Uh, what you would do through that is we have people who are inactive as subs, and when we call, they can become active. The great news behind that is it put it, we were growing at about 14% uh, a month in terms of adding subs. We grew about 48% after that. We currently have 250 potential subs in the pipeline. Is that correct, Dr. Turner? And of that 250, they have to go through a process of background checks, TB tests, and have to take a five hour classroom management. So no one is put into a classroom until they fulfill those requirements. However, we were very excited. Uh, and so with a a, a sub pool of uh, 328 existing subs with a potentiality of 250 new subs coming on board. We feel that we can, uh, we're excited about the potential of being able to manage another one of these spikes in, 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 in our absences. Um, the questions were asked, Dr. Rawson, what considerations do you use before going to virtual learning? Uh, the South Carolina uh, COVID-19 guidance from DHEC uh, gives us um, four conditions. We really focus on condition number one, so I just want that to be very clear. You can look at our dashboard and you will see that there's a marker of 30% or higher of absenticity due to COVID-19. And you may see on our dashboard uh, schools above the 30%, but they're still operating. And the question is why? Um, if you look at the first paragraph in that guidance, there's uh, no specific evidence based on uh, those, those metrics. So what we rely on is uh, criterion number one, school is unable to maintain operations with current staffing as determined by the school district. Uh, that is a dis discussion that uh, leads off with our uh, chief of administration and academics, uh, Ms. Miller, and we start off that conversation with the principal and our directors, and it moves up to the superintendent and before we inform the board. But we try everything as possible that we can to make sure that we are able to maintain um, what we call ISS, instruction, safety, and supervision. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, before we move into our uh, monthly financials, I wanted to uh, pause here if there were any questions. Um, Dr. Ross, um, the, the first bullet, unable to maintain operations, I've got some questions from people because they were looking at the COVID dashboard and it looked like the staffing was not down that much, but that's only reflecting staff that are out due to COVID. If they're out to take care of a sick child or a quarantine child or for pr other reasons, it doesn't reflect on that dashboard, correct? Right, what, what uh, that only gives part of the story. The reality of the story is gonna be reflected in these numbers here. And so this, this chart will show what we were feeling in that week. Um, also, and, and I think this is, um, you know, one of those things under full transparency, our nurses are on overdrive right now. And uh, they're working, they'll be working till 11 o'clock tonight, um, entering in data. But they're working just to be behind. So we might not even have everything in there when we report it that day. And uh, that's just a reality. So we depend heavily on that principle to know what's the scope uh, because the dashboard is doing its best but when you have workflows that are coming through like the chocolates on that conveyor belt, it is very hard to expect that staff to get all those parents contacted and that dashboard updated before the deadline of the turnover. So, so we can, we, this is more reflective of the reality. Dr. Ross, when, when um, I think we said we, you know, we're short on contract, contact tracing and that, that that's putting our nurses into a big, um, dilemma and I know you I, th I believe you've told me or or most of the board or all the board that um, that teachers can only be uh, advised of contract contact tracing after they've been trained and I wanted to know how that how that uh, uh, you know is handled when you've got uh, so many substitute teachers 
how do you do that? You know, how, how does that, how is that accomplished? I'll uh, refer to administration if I, if I omit anything in the answer. Um, the reality is to make sure that there is, everyone's on the same page, we isolate that contact tracing in the, in the health room, in the nurse's station. So that's the person who's pointing to, this is how long a person can be in school and this is when they have to isolate or quarantine. Uh, what we're finding is that workflow may have worked for Alpha, was stressed during Delta, it is not possible during um, Omicron. What we have uh, asked uh, uh, through the contractual matter is that we come up with a new workflow uh, to um, uh, what we call surge protectors. These are perm subs who are located in, at our building, uh, that they are the ones that are trained and uh, they constantly do that. We have also reached out through, and, and Dr. Uh, Harris can help me as well with, is it DHEC in terms of uh, some trained contact tracers that we would use as a hub? It is correct. CDC Foundation is the name, but it is uh, 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 a component of DHEC. Yeah. Uh, that would give tr uh, train, but as we, there's um, realities and new people coming in, and you know, finding out where to, 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 to place them. So we are working um, all of these solutions as a, as a way to, to get ahead of this, of, of this contact tracing. It's important that you bring this up because uh, we, I keep looking at Dr. Harris because uh, we're trying to keep track of how many revisions we've had to this operation guidance. Uh, we're on the seventh revision. So um, it's important not to burden the teacher down with all of the requirements that the teacher has with keeping up with these additional revisions. So by isolating that with a staff that's just focused on that, uh, we can have less error um, there as well. Um, and with uh, now, um, COVID-19 has been added to our exclusion list. So it's under statutory authority. So we're, we have to do our best to make sure that we are um, responding to the law. Any other questions on this? Ms. Huddle? I think I know the answer to this, but I have to ask. Um, <clears throat> we have received lots of emails from parents who are getting these kind of rolling quarantines. You know, their child is out and they get back and then another child in the same class. And typically these are where entire classes are being quarantined because they're kindergarten or first grade. Um, and the reason I said I think I know the answer is because I trust that you guys are doing everything you possibly can, but I can't help but ask on behalf of these parents, is there anything else that we as a district can do or that the board can do to help to try to, to eliminate these just, you know, perpetual quarantines for children? Uh, uh, correct. So there is the, um, there's the standard um, exceptions to quarantine versus the... Uh, 90 days, um, and, and if, you, if you've been positive within the last 90 days, then you don't have to quarantine. If a student has um, what they call maximally vaccinated, you don't have to quarantine. Um, if the student has um, is wearing a mask, which is very hard to administrate in, a, in an area where we, 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 the masks are heavily encouraged. Uh, but we also uh, are seeing uh, and I, I empathize with that as well. You can't get your kid back in and then you get a call um, and, they, and they haven't met those criteria. Uh, some schools, um, uh, Ms. Miller, if you have something to add, I'll let you add that, but some schools are looking at learning labs, so um, Ms. Miller, want to speak about how that can work and how we can expand that? Um. I'm sorry, are you, are you referring to the learning labs, not the tutoring? I'm sorry, Dr. Ross. I, no, that's okay. I, I, the, I think Irmo Elementary School is one of those schools looking at an option where a parent does not have to have this rolling um, quarantine. And uh, that's something that we, we just kind of came up on um, last week. That's something I think we can look at as expanding to give some kind of guarantee if you're not in that maximally, I mean, if you're not in that um, exempt from quarantine stages. 
So that'll be the three layers that we could do um, uh, to keep a, a, a you know, to, to make sure that, that that child is not in there. Um, but I, I didn't want, if there was something else you wanted to add, I didn't want to cut you off. We are absolutely looking at everything that we can do. Um, and our schools and our principals, our teachers, everybody, you know, is, is just looking for that. Um, we are also, um, Dr. Harris's office, in constant communication with DHEC, sharing the hardships that are there and asking them to continue to review their policies. So, and I, I apologize, I was not aware of their learning lab at Irma Middle, but I will be tomorrow. <laughs> it, 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 it was something, I got an email on the way here and uh, asked the, the principal uh, to contact Irmo Elementary School because I, I was in transit and um, I said, well, that might be something that if we can put across the entire system to stop these perpetual uh, quarantines. Uh, it is a huge disruption, I understand. Ms. Gardner. Well, and I also wanted to ask um, what's being done about, so it seems that that the quarantine, the policy might be the same across the district, but the way it's implemented in a couple of schools has been, in, in our opinion, extreme. And so I was wondering what's happened, are you doing the right thing by training the nurses as, to make sure that, the, I mean, in my opinion, the, the first thing they should be doing is not worrying about contact tracing. They should be taking care of the children and their health needs before worrying about contact tracing. And then secondarily, if they have time, that's what happens. But, but apparently that may not be happening across the board and it's being handled differently. We just know that there's a couple of schools out there that have just had, like the whole classrooms go home and, and that just seems excessive and I just wanna know if that's the training that that nurse is getting or if that's her own opinion about how it should be held, handled or what, what's going on with that? That's, that's, a, that's a good question. It's ideally it is that there is a consistency in the uh, execution. I cannot promise you that's what's exactly happening. What I believe that uh, by going with the surge protector and, I, and, and, and taking those duties off, that we have more of a hand on who's uh, doing this and I don't have a nurse who's trying to do three different things and get this right. So I believe if I can uh, centralize this process that anytime there's inconsistencies, I can go right to that point and, and change it immediately you can't train a nurse during the hours of 6 a.m. to 7 because they're constantly in that in that work and um, so if we can we can use someone who's not in there through the amending this we have that flexibility because all they're doing is that work and uh, we hope that um, reduces errors that's one thing uh, um, and, and, and I'm not going to ask for patience because I understand, you know, we're dealing with our kids, but we are seeing increasing in errors in our workflows. And, and we have great professional people who, who really don't like to be in that space. So I, I, I hope that this amendment will allow us, one, to pick up efficiencies, clear up misunderstandings so that we don't have one school doing one thing, and then when we have cool ideas, um, that we can spread those ideas quickly throughout the system. The other um, I issue is uh, we waited a week to implement the five day. And even in, while waiting that week, there was still confusion on that, you know, trying to get people back in. So as these, when we get the eighth or the ninth variation of this, um, by pooling together one consistent group who handles this, and we think that we could pivot faster. And now the teacher, the nurse, the administrators, their hands are off. It's just one group. And that's a great point. Um, I, I had a question. This might be m more for um, Ms. Miller. But um, I know at, at my middle school, and I, I don't know if this is consistent across the state, but it really works well in my class. And we have not had at all any large quarantines where a lot of my kids were out. But I have a, to have a seating chart. And so I know who sits by who. And they don't send home a whole class. It's only those that were right near them. And maybe we're doing that. But, it, you know, Miss Miller, I don't know. It may be different in the schools. But would you 
Absolutely. You have some knowledge of that? Thank you. I do have knowledge of that. Thank you. Um, yes, we do have um, the seating charts in all of our classes, and the nurse has access to those. Mm -hmm. um, our substitutes have access to those to make sure that is where they sit if a substitute is there, because we have a lot of substitutes right now. So they are working very hard at that. I wonder, um, Ms. Gardner, clustering happens in the elementary school. And I think that's one thing that um, happens. So if a child, if you have X number of children, I think it's maybe three within a class who test positive within a certain amount of days, then the entire class, it's called a cluster, and the entire class is quarantined. So that could be something. So it's different. I, I see what you're saying. It's just and the that's age at any of level. the children. Yes, ma'am. That's yeah. at any level with the cluster but it's more common in the elementary schools because as you can imagine, those children mix a lot more sure. um, and it's a lot more close. So. Well, would you say that if you look at the data, it is um, in our middle and high school, it's fewer children that are being quarantined than in our elementary? Um, I have not looked at the data that closely, Ms. Hammond. We're just looking at the numbers to see and talking with the principals, can you, can you make the um, instruction safety and supervision work? So. Um, I will tell you that we get equal number of calls when we're talking with those principals, mm -hmm. even when the student um, percentage isn't as high or the, the adult percentage isn't as high. Um, as Ms. Huddle asked, adults are out for other reasons. Mm -hmm. And so that, that safety and supervision piece and can we provide that effective instruction comes in. And that has been equal among elementary, intermediate, middle and high. And I've had calls, and, and I know this is a concern for, for your, the staff, but children with IEPs, you know, that have special needs that, that are out. Even, if, let's say, one parent that called me about speech and how important it is that the child sees the teacher's face and mouth, you know, all of that is part of if they have a speech problem and they're missing a certain amount of class. So. Um, I know it's really no answer, but I need, I want the public to know this board and this administration hears the, the need for change, and that's one reason our resolution went to the DHEC, I don't know how much good it did. They changed a few things, but I think we still need as a public to uh, talk to DHEC and people that make our laws. Yes, ma'am. I will say that with our special education, um, even though they're missing the class, we are meeting their accommodations. We have the contingency plans specific for COVID and quarantines and isolation. Good. So if a parent feels that way, please reach out to that principal or that um, case manager. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions on that, Ms. Gardner? I, I'm just wondering too, are we doing anything um, as a district or even should we be advocating with DHEC about the fact that, that it seems that yes, we're having a spike in cases. There's a lot of people having the cases, but it's been proven that it's not as um, there's not as many bad side effects for, for the newer strains. So we're actually um, we're, we're using the same guidelines based on what it, you know on the more deadly strain when we're when we're moving shifting towards other strains that may or may not be that you know I hate to use the word deadly because the in for children it's not deadly and for children it's just something that they have to go through and I get frustrated personally with the fact that we make them the, the bad guys we don't quarantine anywhere else in the world just in our schools but I'm getting off my high horse here but do we are we are we looking at the fact that we're treating this as a deadly issue when it's not and it never has been for children but now we're getting away from that is there something that we should be doing to factor that in when we do the you know the the quarantining and the contact tracing and things like that. To, to speak to that point, right, there is, and I talked to, you know, when I think about this, my question to our DHEC contact, is this more endemic? Are we going to be dealing with this as um, uh, a more endemic situation? And then what are those protocols? Because we have to live with COVID, right? This is not, uh, not going away. Um, the hesitation of moving the district past what our health board says now, especially that it's, it's there's statutory authority of the exclusion list. Um, we haven't jumped out in, in that capacity not to move away from what we're currently doing. But to your point, we saw the guidance change with teachers. And so you, you can you know, maybe forecast that that may come down with students as well. 
Uh, and, I, and that's not a promise, and that's not speaking for them, but that's just speaking my opinion to, to that question, that uh, there, be, there may be conversations about what, what this looks like endemically. Um, uh, and, and so, but until then, we'll, we'll follow the health board recommendations. But I do, I do see with that latest guidance for teachers, um, some shifting away from what we, we were doing with Delta and Alpha. I have one more question. Um, as crazy as it sounds, I've had some parents say that they think that um, people are reporting false positives in order to keep their kids from having to be quarantined for 90 days. So my question is, do we require proof of the positive test and do we keep that on file? Dr. Harris, what's required in the health station? The answer to that is, is yes, um, but of course it's based on what is provided by the parent that's given, given to the nurse or the health room. So, okay, so uh, a parent can just say my child tested positive, they don't have to give the actual proof? There is documentation that's recorded I think I hear, there's some documentation recorded in the health room based on what is provided by the parents, and that's what we, the uh, nurses, operate under. Or based okay. On. I mean, I would like to just, I can't, I'm well, not going to make a motion on this, but I'd like to suggest that we require that, that it actually, and, and um, I guess Ms. Hines has a comment on that, but, you know, if that's true, that people are saying their child tested positive just to keep them from quarantine, they're affecting the education of other children if that's happening. Well, I don't know if that's happened, but I know as a parent with children that miss school, when you miss school, you have to um, provide a, a note with your registrar. So when my children um, have had, <clears throat> you know, when they, when they have been sick, we've had to have a doctor's note from the doctor with their test results saying that they are out for this period of time and based on what they were diagnosed with, indicated when they needed to be out of school. So I, I've heard that rumor, but I know that, um, you know, my children have been in different schools over the last couple of years, but I can say as recently as this year, I, my, our registrar has our, has required a doctor's note. Well, and it, that um, may be, be happening. Because of truancy. Title. That may be happening. I think one way just to squash any rumors is just to say, just to put it out there in, in the policy is, you must provide proof of a positive test. Well, this is, again, just my opinion, but I think that should be left up to the administration. That's an operational thing. I agree, Ms. Hammer, but I mean, I, I'm just, that's why I said I'm not making a motion, I'm just making a suggestion, mm -hmm. because we're here to represent the community, and, I've, and I'm hearing that. Mm -hmm. And I think an easy solution is just to say, you have to do this, because it does make sense. It is an illogical exclusion rules. Okay, so I can see the temptation with, uh, especially these back-to-back -back quarantines, I can definitely see if, if the parent thinks there's a loophole, it'll keep their kid in school for 90 days, they might take it. And Ms. Uh, Hines is right, I would tell you as a teacher, when a student is out, they do have to bring a, they do have to bring a note. So that should be, and that would just be, to me, incumbent upon the, the staff to see that, that it's, you know, legitimate and that they prove, have the proof of that. One thing I would, would like to add to this conversation, too, is uh, I think we have to give uh, legitimacy to the reality that's happening in the health station. Um, we have various if-then statements that are going in of when that test was uh, came back positive, when the symptoms actually started, when that test was um, taken, when they get the results, and, and all of that enters into a different equation. That's one of the reasons I want to pull these duties out um, to shore up um, exactly the, the, the way that we're returning. So we don't have these inconsistencies. Many of times the testing is happening by a third party who is also reported, required to report that to DHEC. And so there's a back, a way to check that. Uh, with the home testing now, that's becoming a little going different. Out this right? So we, we, will, we will improve um, and, and look at those issues, um, especially with that, with that home test. So. And on top of all this, just to make it even more confusing, because I know my daughter was tested positive, it stays in your system. You may still test positive for weeks and weeks, but you're well. So that's an important point that, that your nurses are having to deal, and, and DHEC has to deal with. So we just, you know, I'm glad it's down to five. 
I'm, you know, I'm hoping it's going to get changed. Well, we'll not solve this, but Dr. Ross, thank you, and thank you, board, for the questions and comments about it. Did there, anybody else want to say anything that didn't? Ms. Moore or Mr. Hogan, anything? Okay. Um, so we'll move on to uh, monthly at, financial report. At this time, we'll have our monthly financial report, and uh, while our CFO, Marty Rawls, is coming to the uh, mic, I wanted to get an update on our sub numbers to accurately report it. So we have 326 active subs in the system and 265 uh, inactive or in progress uh, subs. So I just wanted to make sure that that number was correct. Thank Again, you, Ms. Ms. Ross. Ross. Madam Chair, members of the board and Dr. Ross, uh, we are getting the revenue report loaded. This will be the monthly revenues as of the end of November. This will be before uh, tax revenues would have started coming in. So you're going to see a, a huge jump in the property tax revenues over the next couple of months. Um, about 15% of our local uh, was received at that point in time and a little over 30% of our state sources um, plus the other EIA funds. Are there any re questions regarding the revenues? Any questions? You're doing great. All right. We'll go to the expenditure report. As of this uh, November 30th date, we had spent approximately 34% of our budget. Remember, this year the um, bonus was paid in November, so you'll see a little bit of a difference here because it was not paid in November of 2020. So that's a, a little over $3.2 million with, sal with the bonus and the benefits attached to it. So you can see um, the, the gap between comparing November 21 to November 20 is a little larger than normal. It should even, everything should even back out when we look at the December and January numbers. One thing I want to um, bring up also, you'll see a, a pretty big difference between the percent expended and instructional, um, if we're looking at salaries and fringe, for instance, versus the support and community services. When you look at those numbers, the instructional piece, the majority of those individuals are 190-day contract people. So they didn't get their first check until August the 31st. So we're working on less payrolls having happened for those individuals than the 240, which would be the majority of the support and community services. So it looks like a larger percentage, but it's just that we're working on three less payrolls on that top line as compared to the uh, support and community services. Just want to make sure that everybody was aware of that. Any questions regarding the expenditures? Any questions on that part? Um, I just have a question in that, as you did mention <clears throat> the comparison to last year, um, but could maybe going forward, could we get that in, on, in these reports as well, like a comparison? I don't, I don't think it's in, it's a, to budget in here, right? Is there one where it shows? On, on the bottom where it shows the comparison in total, the 34% versus the 31? Yeah, I was just wondering by line item, would it be possible? to like get a schedule just like this one next time, but compare actual this year to actual last year by line sure. item. Mm -hmm. It just is hard because like you said, some expenses are further ahead or behind just because of that particular type of expense. Mm -hmm. So to me, it would be easier to tell how we're doing compared to the same period last year. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Little. You'll always have a little bit of variation also with the teachers. And with when you look at 85% of our budget or 85 to 87% of salaries and fringe, that's where your majority of your fluctuation would be. Um, where we may have teachers, we may have had a, a third year teacher leave and replace them with a 20 year teacher or whatever. So it's, it's, you're not ever really comparing apples to apples. It's close. Thank you, Ms. Huddle. Any other question? Thank you so much, Ms. Rawls. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rawls, and I'd like to uh, introduce Audrey Jaramillo. Yes. Did I say it right? Yes, sir. And uh, of our HAR auditing group. Uh, they're from Albuquerque, New Mexico, so she's here uh, during the procurement audit. Uh, it stands to the, be recognized by the board. Welcome. Uh, we'll Welcome. Be, 
with us uh, until Thursday going over our, um, our procurement, doing our procurement audit. So uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, moving forward with our, our budget philosophy, we talked about the role of a school at the last board meeting and uh, put three images here. Um, our resident historian, uh, uh, Mr. Holden, put together of our oldest facility or sites in Chapin, high, in Chapin, in Armo, and in Dutch Fork. And we talked about the role of the school when these sites open versus the role that we have and the mission that we have today. And education, of course, is changed. And as we have this imperative, you're all aware of the redesign, uh, even in the change of our law um, of uh, 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 Section 5950 uh, of our uh, Code of Laws with the purpose of schools and changing in 2006 to talk about that profile of a South Carolina graduate. We have now an imperative of academic, social, and emotional growth and development. Uh, for our students. So uh, the question is, how do we get that? How do we uh, uh, reach that? With more and more being placed on the role of the teacher, uh, something has to give. Uh, we cannot ask the teacher to do uh, all of this by themselves. And so uh, as we talk about a budget philosophy, I believe in this whole child continuum and uh, that we as a district support our students, protecting them uh, from uh, the, by addressing their physical safety, protecting them through their physical health, as we're talking about a lot tonight, uh, their social needs for the children who, who may be homeless or don't have clothes or uh, 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 food insecurity, and how that affects their mental health. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion on what are we doing to address behavioral needs. Well, if you don't take care of the four things before behavioral uh, needs, you won't find any gains in, in, in the behaviors. Uh, and so uh, once we can uh, address those needs, then we can handle things of academic readiness, those reading gaps, and uh, therefore supporting uh, the teachers uh, as they meet the educational needs. Any gap in the umbrella uh, causes us inconsistencies and, and uh, jeopardizes our ability to meet that entire need of the child. And so as we look at our, our current umbrella, we see there's gaps uh, in terms of physical health, uh, be bringing to the board for a, a, a year-round nurse uh, to allow us to address these changes, um, uh, lead nurse, uh, throughout the summer. Uh, a mental health services officer to help us fill those gaps as we're trying to address the behavioral skills. There are always underlining issues. Hurt people hurt people. And if we don't address the hurt in those people, then they're gonna continue to hurt others. And so we need to fill that gap there. And then uh, a, a lead school counselor to help us with the academic readiness. When we look at the data of how the lagging reading rates behind those students, um, especially those that we see a lot of the behavioral issues with, um, we have to address that. And that's, uh, that's in the summer, that's on weekends, that's uh, when school's out and so after school so a lead school counselor to help us in that, in that charge. Our goal is to look at how we can repurpose existing uh, positions into these roles. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to um, uh, bring this to you uh, to talk about uh, this philosophy. I believe that if we can shore up our continuum, uh, uh, that umbrella that protects our students, that they will shine in the rainbow of success when all of their needs are met. And uh, well, we believe that this is the imperative of, of having uh, success in all of our schools for all of our children. In that vein, we're gonna need teachers uh, to help us deliver this. I showed uh, information about the number of teachers leaving, leaving the profession. We saw in the state newspaper um, just today an article about uh, why teachers are leaving. And so we are now in, in um, Dr. Turner and her team are actively recruiting, but from a very shallow pool of those entering the teaching uh, force. And if you look at attracting teachers, uh, what our starting salary is, our benefit package, uh, their retirement um, uh, package, uh, we see that there's a reality 
that was cited in that news article today about the need to help with student loans for some of for these professionals. If we look at uh, a July 2021 report about the average student loan debt of a new teacher in the United States, they're carrying about $58,700 of student loan debt. You look at this, the debt to income ratio of this uh, educator, and it becomes tough to have increasing responsibilities uh, with, with this type of um, uh, package. So we're excited that we have launched and we thank uh, for the endorsement of our NARI. We heard of Terry, which retracts uh, teachers, but this is NARI. This is our new educator uh, retention incentive uh, that has either direct payments to employees or uh, through a, uh, a um, a new law that uh, Ms. Rawls brought to us, I think uh, that was initiated under the Trump administration, we can make direct payments to decrease student loan debts that, that qualify. So they can take uh, this $2,500 a year and make those payments to student loans. So this is something unique to School District 5. Uh, while money is not the only issue that uh, our, our teachers are dealing with, especially those in the first three years, which we see leave the profession, this helps us uh, recruit and, re and retain existing teachers. The benefit is uh, available for our current teachers. So if you're at experience level zero, one or two, then you qualify for, uh, for this program. So uh, we thank our HR department, thank this board for its support and uh, um, doing everything to support our teachers, especially those at the beginning of uh, their, their careers and professions in education. Uh, so with that, that concludes the superintendent's report, and I stand for any questions. Any questions? Questions, questions. Yeah. Mr. Lovis? Questions. I have an observation. I was, uh, I've been going around to the schools, of course, as I could between COVID and talking to teachers. And one of the main things that, um, that I find that if we could offer some kind of way to have um, uh, day, uh, care for their children while they're in school, that that in, would be a tremendous incentive, incentive to keeping them in our district and also to, uh, for new hires. I saw in that same article that you read, uh, one of the highest correlations there between the questions asked and, of the teachers that had left the profession and left the school districts, where it, I think it was 71% uh, said that um, that was because they were looking for a school district that more closely uh, resembled the needs that they have. Okay, so. I'm thinking that if we could some way, and I'm sure there's tax, tax um, advantage ways to do that with, with the federal income tax where you could offer child care in schools and make that um, less expensive on the teacher, I think that would be a way that we would have to uh, garner great employees from, from, from here on out. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Hines? Um, totally different oh, Ms. subject, but um, I, oh, I wanted okay. to wait to the end to, um, we all got a um, letter back from our um, motion that went to our resolution that went to DHEC yeah. and it's dated January 20th, 2022, so that the public can see this motion. I'm, I'm, I moved, I mean, this letter, I moved that we enter it into the minutes mm -hmm. of today's meeting. Is there a second? Ms. Hines seconds. Any discussion on it? I think it was a very important thing to do, and I agree with you. So all those in favor of adding that to the minute, or into the record, excuse me, in that seven and no. Thank you, Ms. Huddle. All right, we'll Ms. go Hammond. back. Ms. Hand, yeah. um, I have You had a question on this. Um, yeah. Yes, I have something on the superintendent's report. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in Dr. Ross's superintendent's report, every um, every meeting he talks about the system involving education and the importance of stakeholders in um, our school district and we've had some conversations internally as a board but um, for purposes of right now I would like to move that the board of trustees 
for School District 5 of Lexington, Richland County, adopt the attached resolution recognizing parental rights, stakeholder authority, and political participation. Are you, are you seconding it? Okay. And I'm going to read this and explain why I'm Yeah, I was going to say, you got yes. a copy for everybody? Yes, I, okay. I'm passing Thank a copy you. of it, and I'm going to read it out loud. Um, whereas the Board of Trustees for School District 5 of Lexington and Richland County recognizes that the current political climate on a federal, state, and local level have raised serious concerns about the roles of stakeholders in education, especially for parents. Whereas on September 29th, 2021, the National School Board Association asked President Joe Biden to label parents as domestic terrorists for questioning local school board policies. Whereas on September 30th, 2021, the United States Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, testified before the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions that parents shouldn't be the primary stakeholder in their children's education. Whereas on November 8th, 2021, the South Carolina School Board Association withdrew its membership from the National School Board Association due to its actions. Whereas politically charged education organizations within South Carolina are actively lobbying to eliminate any parental authority as evidenced by social media posts displayed by SC Fred on January 13th, 2022, stating in part, that teachers should have the authority to make decisions about what's best for their students. Whereas parents and or legal guardians are the primary stakeholders in their children's lives, including matters relating to education. Whereas as stakeholders, parents are responsible for what their children are taught. Whereas being responsible, parents have the inalienable right to be part of the political process with input regarding adopting policy within their local district school boards. Whereas current board policy KB for the School District 5 of Lexington and Richland County states that the board believes it can impact achievement by improving the quality and quantity of parent and family involvement in the education of their children. Be it resolved that the Board of Trustees for School District 5 of Lexington and Richland Counties affirms that stakeholders in education are crucial and that the district should encourage a complete stakeholder assessment to identify roles and further collaboration between district administration, teachers, community members, and parents. Be it resolved that the Board of Trustees for School District 5 of Lexington and Richland Counties affirms that parents and or legal guardians are the primary stakeholders and primary political participants in their children's lives. And be it resolved that the Board of Trustees for School District 5 of Lexington and Richland Counties affirms the following statements and the policy committee will discuss amending policy KB or creating new policy to also identify that one, parents are the prim primary stakeholders in their children's education. Two, as primary stakeholders, parents have the right to direct their ch child's education unless otherwise prohibited by court order or state law. Three, that as primary stakeholders, parents and or legal guardians have the inalienable right to be part of the political process with input regarding the adoption of policy for School District 5 of Lexington and Richland Counties. And four, as primary stakeholders, parents and or legal guardians make decisions about the welfare and health for their children unless otherwise prohibited by court order or state law to be adopted by the Board of Trustees of School District 5 in Lexington and Richland Counties on January 24th, 2022. So that is the resolution that I am have moved, um, have made a motion to be adopted by our district. And the reason that I am bringing this forward is we're having all of these conversations about teachers and about um, about parents, and there are there is so much external chatter, and we are hearing from parents that they are concerned that they're not they are not able to make the decisions. And we've been asked for months to discuss this as a board. Um, and I, I know that I've asked for this to be put on the discussion agenda um, rather than a motion. And I know that there is discussion about having this implemented in policy in the policy committee. 
but this resolution is a statement affirming that parents are important in their child's life, in their children's life, that they are the primary stakeholder. One of the things that Dr. Ross has, has mentioned as he's talked about the role of teachers um, and, and all of the stakeholders is that the district has the students for eight hours a day, and the remainder of the day, you know, where are they? Who's responsible for them? Parents are responsible for their children for 24 hours of the day and they should feel comfortable, and we should feel um, comfortable saying that their input is important into the process and that they are being included. And this resolution is just affirming what we're already doing partly as a district, but addressing those concerns that we are not publicly addressing, because I know that we've all received a lot of emails from parents concerned about what's happening in Washington or concerned about what's happening um, at the State House. And this week, they're starting committee meetings on education and the roles of parents in education. So I am saying that I think it's important as a parent, you know, I mean, as a parent, that this is something that we should say that is important to us as a district. Thank you, Thank Ms. Hines. Um, I, I would say in, in defense of the board, I, I totally agree with you because it's been brought up publicly that w it would get discussed in public, and I had promised you that. I simply had respected the policy committee that wanted to look at it in the committee and which we would bring to the public. So since you brought this resolution, though, and it's had a second, I think it's 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 okay. I mean, I'm I'm happy to for us to discuss it. I always agreed that it should be discussed in public, so that because we have had maybe six meetings that it's been brought up. Um, any other comments? So, Miss Moore, we'll discuss it before the vote. Um, my own, one of my questions is is that by releasing this um, stakeholder authority, we are by no means saying that the teachers that this trumps the teachers and the administration. Correct when it comes to what is happening within the classroom and what the teachers and the administration are seeing with a child, whether it be a behavior or a lack of education or, or anything like that. I, I, I'll let Ms. Hines answer it, but I would. In my opinion, yeah. it's not necessarily, I mean, when you use words like Trump, I mean, it, it's almost like that's adversarial. But parents are the most important, or parents and or legal guardians, because not every student necessarily has uh, yeah. one or both parents involved. And, and I recognize that, and I tried to frame this resolution to acknowledge that. Um, but at the end of the day, if those parties are involved in their child's life, they are the most important. That doesn't mean that a, that a teacher cannot address an issue or that cannot, cannot address concerns. And it, this also doesn't mean, um, you know, I've heard that there's concerns that by, ha by, by publicly stating the, the role of a parent in their child's life, that that means that parents are going to storm the school and demand that teachers, you know, that, that there's like this, you know, mass invasion of every classroom. That, that's not what this means. What this means is publicly, we have very important people in, in the country, in our state, in our own district, um, that have made comments that make it feel like parents can't address what their concerns are or that it's not important. And that the, parent, that the teacher is the ultimate authority. And we all know that that's not true. Not true. And so this point. addresses that. Does that answer? Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's well, why one of the, one of the um, statements in this resolution says that we need to encourage that stakeholder assessment, encourage the discussion of those roles among all of the parties. And I know that there have been attempts by the district to do that, but maybe we need to strengthen those efforts to get more than just a select group of people involved in those conversations and continue to push it outwardly. Let me um, bring us together. One thing I want to say to Dr. Ross as far as I know that in our district, because we, we've discussed this since it's been brought up to the, um, you know, to in the public, that we do have, we teach the standards, we do have, we have many avenues in place that parents are, do have a, a say in their child's education. So what I would like to say is I have no problem with a resolution that does affirm the importance of parents and that there and and there is a national movement about that but what I, what I want to hear from all the board not not in science has brought this forward we've had a second I'd like to hear if there are any questions 
from the rest of the board. I'd like to hear from everybody before we would vote on this. And I'd also like to have Dr. Ross have a chance to express and share what he sees as avenues for. Because uh, I, I, I agree that it should never be a teacher against a parent. We're together for the child's education. So let's hear from both sides. Um, you had something, Ms. Huddle, and then if Mr. Hogan, <coughs> Mr. Lovelace, I'll come back to you and Mr. Gardner, because we've, we've heard from Ms. Hines, we've not heard, and we've um, heard from Ms. Moore. Yeah. Okay, I just want to state that I, I support the spirit of this. Um, where I have concerns is twofold. One is, to me, a resolution is, is like what we did with DHEC. It's when you, you don't have the power to do something, you say, I want this other entity to do it. And we do have the power to, through policy to affect change. So I'd much rather do this through policy because then you have to be precise because I'll get to my concerns. And I'll just, the second one, as a primary stakeholder, parents have the right to direct their child's education unless otherwise prohibited by court. I don't really know what that means. And I'm concerned that that gives parents a license to send a list to, to the teacher. I don't want... Um, I don't want to talk about the Civil War. I don't want to hear about biology or reproduction or just, you know, just a list. And then what are our, our, our teachers are supposed to keep up with that? And I'm not saying that's the intention. I'm saying that by not clarifying the language, I don't know what, what I'm voting for. And it, it would concern me to do it in this manner as opposed to a policy where we can be very specific and intentional. Mr. Lovelace, and then Ms. Gardner, and then Ms. Hogan. Uh, you, somebody else can. But, um, first, of all, first of all, we all agree that parents are important and always have. We always have. Parents, you know, parents are important and they always have been. They are, they're, you know, we, we as a school board are elected by parents, by teachers, by, by uh, citizens, and, and we were supposed to look at every single respect in respect to every single thing that we can to better children's lives, or, or not just children, but our students. We also have adult students. Um, we already have parents as primary stakeholders. We have SICs, we have PTSOs, we have booster clubs, and we have a lot of other organizations. We have a parent-teacher cabinet. Um, we work diligently to include t uh, parents, not just parents that, that come out here to the school board and, and present us with, you know, with, with re resolutions. How, how are we supposed to, are we supposed to discount those people that have worked hard all these years to be part of something and, and to be part of our organization and to be, make us stronger? Are we just supposed to discount them and hand everything over to somebody that we, that, that a group of people that have come in here with their resolution? And I don't give credence to a lot of things that go on nationally because all politics is local. It happens right here and it happens with our hearts and it happens to, to what we do with our finances and our resources. It happens for every single one of our people. Um, to, and which parents are we to listen to? I mean, th this, this has gotten to the point of we're supposed to listen to certain parents but not others, the ones that agree with us or don't, don't agree with us politically. Um, we had a policy committee. Our policy chairman had it on the committee. And, and, and board members didn't show up to discuss it, so, so sh she moved it back to another, dis another time of discussion. So it's not fair to say that this was never, uh, you know, never intended to be brought forth. This is a school board, we're elected, and we're affirming what we already do to give you know, a group of parents uh, rights over what is taught in schools and all, which the state of South Carolina, or the state of South Carolina determines that through a lot of cases, we've had people come in here and lecture us uh, about uh, censorship in books and so forth. Those things do not fall under the, under the purview of this school board. They do not. And, and, and for us to pass something that's just been read to us, I haven't seen this, nobody gave this to me to read until, you know, until it was handed out three minutes ago. And so to expect me to vote on that, to, to disavow what the school board is trying to do, I can't do that, and I, I'm telling you why. 
Ms. Gardner. Um, I had an experience quite a few years ago where I was on a, a board with the school district, um, a volunteer position. We were putting together a mission statement, a new mission statement for our little organization, and I fought hard for the word parent to be put in it, and it was, I was shot down. The word parent was taken out, it's a stakeholder, and it really bothered me. It's been bothering me for years, because I'm pretty sure that that statement is still there. It doesn't have the word parent in it. Um, and so, I feel like that, um, that I think the, the world, there's a, there is, there are entities out there that are fighting against the families. And I believe that there's negative influences out there that are pushing against families, that are pushing against parents and children in this, and, and trying to make us um, not have responsibility for our children, not making family the main priority. And so in light of that, even though I'm a little frustrated that we didn't get to talk about this in a policy committee first, um, I do understand, I have read most of this is taken from one that we were already given. There's a few changes, I believe, that you made. And I do agree that we will put policy KB on our next policy committee. I will do that. Um, I just, um, I don't think that this, personally, I don't think this resolution is saying that parents are the only stakeholders, that, that the primary, meaning top, first, the most important. And I agree with that, and I've agreed with that for many years. I just hope that this doesn't, um, mean that we don't still work as a team when it comes to raising our children or raising or educating our children because everybody's important to that. Um, the only thing that I worry about with this um, truly is because is the climate that we are in right now, I feel like, um, and, I, and I don't know who wants it this way because I certainly don't, but that it's parents against the education system. And I don't want that. I want us to do things to bring us together because we need each other. But at the same time, I do recognize that this, um, that, that parents have been being taken out of education for years because this little incident I had was several years ago. It wasn't recent. Um, and so that's my two cents on that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hogan. <clears throat> my personal opinion as a parent of three kids in this district, um, my wife and I strive to, to present us as the best role models for them and, and to put them above all. But the, uh, we put ourselves as we are the most important people in their lives. Um, but our philosophy also is that the educators they have are the second most important people in their lives. And, and those are the ones that are going to mold them. So I see this resolution as is, is stating that, that the parents are the stakeholders, that I, Matt Hogan, am responsible for my three children. Um, but it does state that we do heavily rely on these schools and these teachers to help us mold. So what this does is it puts us in a position to where we're gonna be included in the conversation. Thank you. Dr. Ross. I, uh, I agree um, with uh, Member Hines that this feedback loop only works with parents. In fact, I get a lot of ideas from parents. And okay. said, Dr. Ross, you're wrong. How about you try this? And we, we talk about it, and, and sometimes they're great solutions. Um, those are on the administrative side. My, my concern is, uh, as administrators, we don't get in, in, into sides. We get into what's presented to us. And I think once we, we, we read what's, what's written, and we administrate what's written in terms of policy, we're always um, right down the center. Um, but this resolution is affecting your policy. You have board policy that speaks to a lot of these issues. We need clarification on what you want us to follow. Right now, some of these things, um, as I'm looking through, could benefit through, as we do most policies, second reading. Mm -hmm. to allow us the opportunity to seek clarification from the administration. Um, that is our concern. For instance, uh, policy KEC, do we keep that or do we, we toss that? That's a, the, a policy that we have. Um, uh, Ms. Miller, can you explain what, what, what that policy is, just an, an example? Yes, sir, I'm happy to. Um, policy KEC is a policy um, for 
complaints against um, or concern or complaints against um, instructional materials. And so um, any, any parent um, or guardian who lives within the district or any citizen who lives within the district can file that formal complaint by using the, the form, the citizen's complaint form, which is KECE, um, and turning that in to the superintendent. Um, at which point we follow the, the rest of that policy and form a school level committee and a district level committee to review that. We also have other policy um, <clears throat> just that came to mind when you were talking about this. Um, we have a textbook policy, so parents are part of our textbook selection process. Um, and we also have, um, I wrote down one more that I thought of, um, policy IJ, inspection of um, materials and resources, and parents can do that at any point in time as well. So, so our concern as administration is um, the role of the board, uh, its established processes that the board has now, and, and what and, and how this would uh, play into part. The constitutional authority that we follow for the state of South Carolina outlines the role that you have as a board. So my certification, certification of the professionals is outlined to that code of laws. And so if we're going to have a shift in that, it would be my recommendation that that be expressed in policy. Uh, this is very closely aligned and we would need the clarification of policy to be able to follow and implement. To, to ensure that we're meeting the spirit of, of, of what's being presented here. And, and the reason I'm saying is, is um, item two, as primary stakeholders, parents have the right to, uh, to direct their child's education uh, unless uh, otherwise prohibited by a court order or state law. Um, to me, that's exactly what we have always done, um, but directing that is explicitly stated out in policies that we have. And so I think it would have benefit from uh, a second look at this, giving us time to ask the questions and, and give our concerns. What I have heard from, from, from all of us, I think everybody agrees that we, um, the spirit of this is certainly um, we all support. I'm hearing how there's a, one or two of the wording that you need clarification with policy. Unless somebody wants to make an amendment, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for a vote on this. Well, I, I, I want, want to make an amendment I, I too. I'm speaking though, Mr. Okay, Lord, I'm sorry. I don't mind. Um, I, I'm gonna call for a vote on this because number one, we asked a, 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 a legal advice about a resolution. It really is just a message. It is a message. And I've heard Dr. Ross has concerns, but I have total faith in this policy, I mean, in this, in this board, with this policy committee to address your concerns. If our message is very important to this community, that parents are important stakeholders. And I did hear that from several of you. I also heard from several of you of your concerns. But I believe that we can, I can support this resolution and knowing we would take these concerns of Dr. Ross's, because this isn't law. We aren't passing a law. If it were, then, you, then I would, I, you know, I may have to wait to, but, but I support the whole spirit of this and I think it's time for the board to take a stand for parents. Ms. Hammond, <clears throat> yes. I'd like to uh, make an uh, um, amendment. Amen. I move that we amend the resolution regarding parental rights, stakeholder authority, and political participation um, to end after the first be it resolved statement, and that the end of that sentence be amended to add and legal guardians. So it would read um, teachers, the, okay. in, the first be it resolved paragraph yeah, okay so it would end there and the very end of that paragraph would also add um, legal guardians so it would say teachers community members and legal guardian and parents slash legal guardians you're just changing the words in that one I'm just adding legal guardians yes ma'am okay is there a second 
seeing none. All right. <laughs> Call, can I call the question? Yes, I'm ready for the question. All right, uh, would you read, not, not the whole thing, just read the, the, the title. I move that the Board of Trustees for School District 5 of Lexington and Richland County adopt the attached resolution recognizing parental rights and stakeholder authority and political participation. All those in favor, yes. That's four, all those opposed. That's three. It carries four to three. I promise you this will go before the policy, Dr. Ross, so that there is no misclarification for your staff. But I, I, I do see four people that support the spirit of this. And I believe that it's a start, and I certainly hope that the parents and the teachers and the staff all know how important it is for us to work together, and no one is against anyone for our different opinions. Ms. Hammond, point of order, you said four people that support the spirit, oh. and I would just like to say You're the that only one that said spirit. I did support the spirit, although I voted no, so I just want a point of uh, order. I got you, I'm sorry. So four supported the resolution as is, thank you. So let's go to, that was part of, and that came after your superintendent's report. Thank you. So we're on number 10. You do on that? Okay, okay. superintendent's report. This is just another question going back. Um, we've had um, Nurse Stanick come in and report to us many times. What is her title if it's not nursing supervisor? Or what is, is Th how is that, that is different her from what? her title, good question. She's not year round, so oh, okay. uh, during the summer months, we, we don't have access to her. Yeah. Okay, that, any more questions on the superintendent's report? So we'll be number 10, approval of minutes of the January 10th, 2022 board meeting. Is there a motion? Ms. Ms. Hammond, I move that we amend, I'm sorry. <laughs> I move that we approve the minutes of the January 10th, 2022 board meeting. Is there a second? Uh, Mr. Huddle, I mean, Mr. Huddle, <laughs> Mr. Hogan, it's, a, it's those ages. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, that's a mo motion and second, all those that approve the minutes. And that is seven to zero. Miss yes. Hammond, I have to abstain because I wasn't. That's at the right. Last meeting. So we have six. Thank you. 